back to our current immigration system is completely broken and causes millions of otherwise law-abiding Americans to have broken the law because there are no current legal answers to the, mor to the moral dilemmas that we face on a daily basis, such as what do you do when you find out the nanny whom your children, the nanny who you trust with your children and who your children love is an undocumented worker? Or when you find an employee who has worked for you in your plant for more than a decade has a mismatched social security card? It's an interesting fact. Did you know that there are less than 30,000 green cards available each year for, for workers from Mexico? It's 30,000 each year for workers from Mexico to stay legally in the United States. And this includes family members as well as the actual workers. According to dat data compiled by Forbes magazine, a 30-year-old Mexican with a high school education and a sibling who lives in the U.S. playing by today's rules and applying for a green card, that can mean waiting in line that stretches 131 years. Fact three, just because short-sighted partisanship has crippled the U.S. Congress's ability to solve any major problems does not mean that Texas is unable to find its own solutions. Unlike Arizona and Alabama that have implemented politically popular yet ineffective and mean-spirited immigration laws, Texas has the creativity, the moral fiber, and the long-range vision to develop legislation in our citizens' true self-interest. Today, in my opinion, our governor has the power, with the stroke of a pen, to establish programs to document and tax undocumented workers. And bringing these, these hardworking Texans out of the shadow economy while raising billions of needed tax dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, we have so much to learn. Let us start today committed to separating the facts from the fiction. A few housekeeping notes. Uh, at your seat, there are index cards. Please complete these index cards um, so that AJC and, and the Bridging America Task Force can email you the extensive and really excellent white papers that have been developed by our experts on the dais. Further, at the end of the session, we will have a Q&A session. So please write down your questions on the index cards um, and we'll try to answer those questions. The director of the Houston Regional Office of the American Jewish Committee. Andy. Mike, thank you. And to Mike and Marcia Nichols, who have co-chaired this summit and working on it with this Bridging America Task Force, Thank you both very, very much, and Dr. Kleinberg, also for your engagement. How we got here, yesterday the Ford Foundation announced for the third year in a row a half a million dollar grant to the American Jewish Committee for its endeavors working on Latino Jewish relations as well as substantial immigration reform efforts. Houston was one of the first four cities in the United States just over two years ago where we brought together business leaders, faith leaders, educators, law enforcement, as others and other stakeholders. And it was the first time everybody sat in the same room to discuss the issues of immigration reform and how to get that. And this is, as Stan Merrick said during the first meeting, it was the first time all those stakeholders sat around the table as opposed to just sitting in partnerships, sitting with over at the Cardinal's office with faith leaders, but really coming together. And today's efforts representing all those areas on the cost savings of implementing immigration reform are why we're here. The task force created this idea over a year ago to have a summit to bring all the stakeholders together as well as to invite the community. And the only other group I want to recognize, the city officials, the elected officials, we are home to the third largest consular corps in the United States. And seeing this morning during the continental breakfast, there's a number of members of the consular corps We've learned from the council before, immigration is a critical issue in a number of countries, in Europe, Asia, as they also take an influx. So a number of them are here today to learn what Houston's doing and looking at on the issue. It's my pleasure to turn the program over to Dr. Kleinberg, and thank you all again very much for joining us.
Well, thank you all so much and welcome, and, and we're enormously gratified to see so many of you here. And apologize for the coffee. I was there too, waiting for my second cup, but I'll be all right. And, uh, this, and now I think coffee is, is, is available. Well, it's a great honor and pleasure for, for me to be been asked to moderate this, this discussion. And, uh, Immigration Summit was really made possible by the tremendous work of the AJC and especially Randy Zorkinski and, and Matt Kahn who's been just extraordinary in, in pulling all of this together. And, and the Kinder Institute is delighted to be to share in the in the uh, sponsoring of this, of this program. We hope to bring something new to this debate, or at least to address a set of issues that are far too often ignored. We want to ask about the costs of our failure to repair a broken immigration system and point to the savings that would accrue if we could institute sensible immigration reform. Not amnesty, but a straightforward policy that would simply identify, document, and tax the undocumented immigrants who are here in Texas now. This is something we could implement without federal legislation and would bring tremendous cost savings and add hundreds of millions of dollars to the tax revenues of this city and this state. Estimated there are something like, what, 11 million undocumented immigrants in America, 1.7 million in Texas, about 400 to 500,000 in the Great Houston metropolitan area. Why have so many people chosen to break our laws to come here illegally? The, the reasons are self-evident. For the past 30 years, we have simply not allowed enough people to come here legally to do the jobs that this economy desperately needs to have done by people who desperately need to do. We have simply not made that possible. Uh, between 1492 and 1965, 82% of all the human beings on the face of this planet who came to these shores came from Europe. We were a of European nationalities. We were operating in the last 40 years of that period, between 1924 and 1965, when one of the most viciously racist laws the U.S. Congress ever passed, the National Origins Quota Act, to give preference to Europeans and overwhelmingly to Northern Europeans. The law was changed in 1965 open the doors for the first time for non-Europeans to come to America in many meaningful numbers. Um, and, and the criteria were primarily based on family reunification and secondarily on professional skills or refugee status. So if you are a Mexican worker in, with, with some skills in construction, or if you want to come here to work in agriculture or in restaurants or in child care and elder care, but you have no immediate relatives in the U.S. and no special skills of, of, of any meaningful sort, and you just want to wait in line and try to come here legally, uh, as, as Mike has reminded us already, there is virtually no line for you to draw or join. If you don't have relatives here, you don't have major connections, there is no number of years that you can wait patiently in line to be allowed to come here legally. There, for all practical purposes, no legal entry is possible for you at all. But meanwhile, there are numerous employers in this country eager to hire you, especially because they can pay you less than prevailing wages, offer no health benefits or safety standards, and even cheat you out of the wages that you earn, knowing that you have you are, you are in no position to complain or to go to any authorities for redress. Immoral and unworthy of a great people as this system is, and what it does to innocent men and women, what we hope to explore this morning is the question of what our policies are doing to the rest of us. What is the impact of these policies for us as ordinary, normal Texans going about our daily business, trying to support our families and trying to, to raise the taxes that are needed to provide for the public good. Um, what does it cost us in lost revenues from the 130,000 undocumented workers in, 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 in the Houston economy who, know, who, who are out of the system and don't pay taxes? What does it cost us in funds and safety when our law enforcement agencies are diverted from arresting migrant criminals by having to hunt down people who pose no threat to anyone. What does it do to our, what does it cost us in having to provide essential social services to workers and families who would ordinarily qualify for federally funded programs, but are ineligible because of their status and in desperate need, a need that we have to respond to? Why is that happening? How much does it cost? And what does it cost us in our efforts to educate the next generation of Houstonians so they can be prepared for a viable future in the high-tech knowledge economy of the 21st century? when so many children drop out of high school because they live in perpetual fear that their parents could be deported at any time, and they know that they themselves may well be denied the opportunity to work in this country, even if they manage to graduate from high school and go on to college. We have assembled a really remarkable group of people here who have 
agreed to come and to help us think through and to try to make quantitative objective measures to what, what are the costs and how do we measure those costs in these various areas. And, and I, I, I guess I, I, I think you know, know them almost without introduction, but let me name all of them in the order in which they'll speak. And then, as, as Mike said, we'll have an opportunity for questions and discussion. And as you think of questions, write, write them down so that you'll have them available uh, during the question and answer. Uh, we are honored and delighted that Larry Kellner is, is here to talk about the areas of business and job, jobs creation. Larry, as you all know, is the, is the chairman, I guess about to leave as chairman of the Greater Houston Partnership. He had been the, the CEO of Continental Airlines. He's now president of Emerald Creek Group, a private equity firm based in Houston. Uh, next. next is uh, Beto Cadenas, who is, he? Who is uh, 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 a practicing attorney with Vincent Elkins, uh, uh, had been uh, chief aide to, to Senator uh, uh, K. Billy Hutchinson and a leading expert on, on, on immigration issues and will talk to us about the impact on law enforcement and, and the issues of safety that come from, from this new reality. Uh, David Lopez is here. Thank you. Oh, delighted he is. He is, of course, the, the uh, uh, fellow for the, and he is the president and CEO of the Harris County Hospital District, fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives, and no more greater expert available to help us think about what are the, what are the implications for healthcare delivery systems in this county. Uh, follow them by, by Deacon Joe Rubio, who is uh, just a stalwart member of this community for years and years, Vice President of Community Relations and Advocacy for Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of Galveston, uh, Houston, and and uh, able to share with us the impact on social services and the efforts to provide services uh, in, in the, the context that we've created with our immigration policies. And last but not least, one of a proud, a proud Rice graduate and, and uh, a student of mine, actually, for which I'm enormously proud, Julian Stavecci, who is uh, uh, now on the, on the, on the uh, Elected HIC trustee of District District Eight uh, of the of the uh, HIC uh, board and, a, and an attorney and a, a, a true expert on on the issues that illegal immigration pose for the education system in this, in this uh, city of ours. <laughs> so again, I think we're in for a tremendous treat and a real opportunity for some serious learning and thinking about these critical issues that will affect so much of our present and our future as, as, as the 21st century unfolds. And uh, I'm now honored to, to invite Larry Kilmer. Good morning. Steve, thank you. And thanks all of you for coming. Uh, I want to start off by thanking Vice, uh, the Kinder Institute, uh, President David LeBron, who's here. Uh, you guys are always great to host things and really uh, add so much to our community by what you open up and what you do. One might wonder, as you look at this and say, you know, immigration reform without question is a politically charged issue. Why would the business community, which often tends to shy away from politically charged issues, have for so long under the leadership of Charles Foster and Scan America and others at the Greater Houston, Greater Houston Partnership, uh, really been such a strong advocate for sensible immigration reform. Why have we stepped out on that issue? Why have we taken it? I think you have to look back at the partnership's mission. We are the Chamber of Commerce with the Economic Development Authority with the Foreign Trade Group. So all that got rolled together in the 80s. And we're really very focused on strong Houston makes a strong business community. A strong business community will lead to a stronger Houston. If you look at where we're at, between 1980 and 2010, this area grew from 3 million people to 6 million people. It's had tremendous growth. Between now and 2040, it's expected to grow to 9 million people. And it only works, societies work and systems work, only if everybody's kind of in the pool together, everybody's participant in making the system work. 
And unfortunately, if you look, the uh, Pew Hispanic Center is the leading authority in kind of working the models to say, if you look at an area, you look at the jobs, how many of those are undocumented? And while their methodologies have changed over the year, if you look at Houston, the low end, you'd say there's 130,000. At the high end, you'd say there's 250,000 undocumented people working. By their very nature, they're hard to track because they're undocumented. They're often working not as employees, but as 1099 contractors. But they do, the way the structure is set up, they undermine the whole system of what we need in tax collection and how business works and how it fits together. And so the partnership has long advocated for sensible immigration reform to figure out how do we make sure that anybody here that's earning dollars is contributing to the tax system and doing their part. If you look at those numbers, let's take the low end, and there's a, a white paper that the economist of the partnership uh, Patrick Jankowski did a great job on, which I encourage you to spend a little time on. It's not long, it's about six pages, but it's a lot longer than I'll go over here. I'm going to get a couple of headlines. But what you see is if you start with the construction trade, that may be the largest part. But as you dig through it, it undermines a lot of parts of the economy to have people who aren't part of the system and who aren't working in the system. And it also undermines the tax structure. And I think all of you have heard where we are as a state and at the federal level for revenues. And so clearly you need that tax base. You need everybody contributing at every job, contributing to that tax base. They're going to live here and use the services. And we've got a system that actually works against that today. And so when you look at some numbers, if you look at the white paper, the other headline number, $1.4 billion per year in taxes just for the Houston region. So let's think about those two numbers for a second. 130,000 at the low end, that's three Minute Maid parks. So just think of the crowds and the traffic when you go to Minute Maid. Think about filling that up three times every day and all the traffic coming in. Just, that's the amount of, that's the size. It's a big problem. This is not a small issue. The low end of the state, it's a very big issue. Then if you think about just the Houston region, just our 10 county region, 1.4 billion in federal and state tax dollars, primarily federal, but also some state dollars. <coughs> if you roll that up every second of every day, while we're sitting here every second, that's about $40. $40, $40. That's unpaid taxes not coming into the system. It's a system that's designed not to allow them. And so if you go back to the partnerships mission, we're big believers. First of all, the partnership has 2,100 members. We are big believers that we're going to speak for our members. So when we take a position like we do on immigration reform, it's with the support of our membership saying, hey, we've got to find a solution to fix the system. The partnership in general is policy focused. Why are we policy focused? Because we believe that's the way you create long-term economic prosperity. All too often, we're worried about measuring the next quarter or the next year. Partnerships take long-term views, whether it's immigration reform, whether it's how the city ought to balance its budget, whether it's on education, which Julia will talk a little bit about the impacts <coughs> to helping the federal center on health care. We've taken a number of policy positions, but sensible immigration reform has been at the top of that list. A couple of things, education, immigration reform, quality of life here, transportation, those core issues, because we believe it's vital to find a solution to that to make the system work for everybody. And we've got a system that's broken. The system stays broken because it's a politically charged issue and people don't want to look at it and actually have to compromise to find the solutions. The partnership's view is, it's like any business issue, you can ignore the issue, that's not going to fix the issue. In any business we know, you've got to step in, you've got to look at it. You're not going to make everybody happy on every issue, but we've got a real problem. And again, I cut back to the headline numbers. 130,000 to 250,000 undocumented workers going to work every day in this region at a billion four, forty dollars a second in taxes not going into the system because we're not addressing the issue. And by the way, it's undermining the entire system when you have that because people don't put people on as employees, they're using them as contractors. We've got all kinds of issues with documentation. As Steve was mentioning, we're getting people have employees, they've got all the proper paperwork, all of a sudden they find out it's not a valid social security number. We've got a lot of challenges. We've got to find a way to fix the system. We 
we've got to find a way to make sure everybody who's here has a chance to, to contribute to the system. We can't have a system that doesn't allow you to do that. Partnerships for the long-term map of kind of performing that. Uh, I think we'll have some Q&A later. That's our headlines. I thank you for being here today. I thank you for your